All right, here we are, Chuck and Brock, and we are doing generous theology, talking about theology from a generous perspective, looking at especially the theology of Herman Bavink, uh, and then also talking about some of the issues that come up uh, uh, sort of around the things that he's written. And that's going to be a little bit of what's going on today. Today, we're going to be talking about God's essence, specifically a section entitled Divine Simplicity, Essence and Attributes from Volume 2 of uh, Bavink's uh, Reformed Dogmatics. And uh, really to sort of just jump right into it uh, here, Brock, uh, this is, uh, I know, an issue that you and I have talked about offline mostly, a little bit, I think, online. Uh, but uh, the idea behind divine simplicity has caused some level of controversy, maybe some level of strife uh, in uh, in certain uh, corners of, of the world. Now, I don't know whether this was at the time that Bavink was writing was necessarily a huge controversy. And in fact, a lot of, uh, a lot of the writing uh, that Bavink does here is, uh, it talks about, you know, other um, sort of uh, other philosophies and, and, and how folks like Spinoza and others, Schleiermacher, uh, talk about the distinction of attributes. Uh, but it does seem that since, uh, since Bavink's time, uh, this is uh, a discussion and perhaps even an argument that has extended uh, and has led to uh, some very interesting uh, discussions, discussions that sometimes uh, seems like have led some people to be perhaps not quite so generous. So today, let's be generous and uh, and you know, obviously, let's stick up for for what we think about these issues, but let's also talk about what what are the, what are the controversies and why are they important and and how does it relate to what uh, Bavink uh, writes here and and so Brock I, I'd be interested knowing uh, that that you've had some uh, a, I think uh, a lot more experience than I have in sort of diving in uh, to this particular issue it maybe um, give us a little bit of the lay of the land what is what is going on um, you know, certainly we can refer back to what it is it that Bavink was dealing with, but how has that discussion that Bavink talks about here, uh, why why has that led to um, some controversy and perhaps some even ungenerous speech among certain uh, reformed thinkers? What, what's what's your perception of what's going on? Oh, my brother, <laughs> you laid it out. Uh, you laid you laid the issue out well. And and I want to back up to, to tell our viewers about our private discussions, you and I, before engaging in this volume. <clears throat> now, when Chuck and I were finishing up volume one of Herman Bavink's Reform Dogmatics, we wanted to stay with Bavink, but we also had some hesitations about going into volume two rather than volume three or four. Not hesitations in the sense that we're unsure doctrinally where we stand, but some hesitations <clears throat> because we enter into this situation that Chuck is talking about. And here's the short story. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, when you're talking about God's essence, somebody is going to be ready to hit you in the face with a pie when you turn the corner. So Chuck, you and I grew up on those movies, those old, those old vaudevillian comedies where everybody <laughs> is just throwing pies at each other and just, you know, and then there's this one person in the corner and he's throwing pies in every direction and no one can catch him. And then finally someone comes up behind him and Boom, gives him a pie right in the face. And that's what's going to happen when anybody, not just us, when anybody talks about God's essence in the ways uh, that Professor Bavink is going is to look at. So you and I had some trepidation because I use the euphemistic phrase throwing pie and that vaudevillian comedy image but the truth is, Chuck, 
we're talking about accusations of heresy. And that's a serious charge. As a matter of fact, it is just about the most serious charge one Christian brother can level at another Christian brother. Uh, because the idea of heresy encompasses some sort of doctrinal belief on the part of the heretic that is so willfully obdurate, so, so fundamentally at odds with something so primary that to hold that position really separates one from God. That's a big deal. And, and Chuck, with generous theology, what were you and I talking about? We were saying things like, how are we going to enter into this pie fight and, and come out of it without getting called heretics, without having our orthodoxy question, um, with saying the wrong Greek term in the wrong Greek place and, and offending, mortally offending some keeper of the flame? <coughs> And and you and I prayed about it uh, somewhat, and and really at the end we decided to go with volume two anyway because we came to this conclusion. We came to the conclusion that no matter what we said, no matter how careful we tried to say it, no matter how scholarly we tried to talk about God's essence, we were going to get pie in the face. We we're going to get somebody on the internet is going to be extremely upset with us. So with that in mind, <laughs> we decided to move forward. Now, what's at stake here? Well, sometimes we have to agree with some people. Sometimes orthodoxy is at stake. Let me give you an example. Uh, there are there are historical movements within Christianity that denied the deity of Jesus. Those are outside of orthodoxy, and we're not being ungenerous by pointing that out. And so there is a time to take a stand, but there's also a time to be very circumspect. And circumscribed and and when we're in this God's essence section we really have to do that and Chuck you and I hate to have to spend time sort of so carefully qualifying this section because really we ought to just read through it and enjoy the riches Professor Bovink brings but this being the time that it is we wanted to warn people that these were the stakes now in our generation, um, the generation that's alive today, uh, Chuck's generation, my generation, so uh, think Generation X, think uh, the last of the baby boomers. This, this has come up in the, in the last 15, 20, 25 years. What's at stake? And, and two camps have largely emerged in Reformed theology. One camp is very scholastic. And, and the other camp is very not. And we're going to take a look at that. Now, there are extremes to be wary of in either camp. But Chuck, you and I are going to plot a safe course because we're going to stick with Professor Bobink. And this is, again, why we bring out this, you know, we've talked about this before, the idea of navigating difficult waters using the buoy system. And so here in this picture, if you are if you're riding in this channel of water on your boat, there's danger in these waters. And people want you to know about the danger and people want people want you to be careful. And so the idea is they've constructed a set of consecutive buoys, green red buoys paired up going through the channel, and if you stay between the buoys, as you go between the channel, you will chart a course that is uh, very considerably and conservatively, quote-unquote, safe. 
And so that's what we're going to do, Chuck. You and I have no interest in necessarily solving all the problems, all the riddles. We're, we're not in a position to solve it all here. We are in a position to share a comfortable orthodoxy. Now, here's the second image related here. And, and the idea is that if you're trying to move through these waters, these buoys are here to help. And so we're going to present tonight to the viewers, we're going to set up a pair of successive buoys. And if the viewers agree with us and come with us, doctrinally speaking, through these buoys, I think we're going to chart something safe. And maybe that's the best that can be hoped for here. So, Chuck, that was a bit of a, of a build-out in terms of a warning, but really I haven't gotten into even stating what the issues are. So forgive me. Let me throw it over to you. How did you see Professor Bavink stating these primary issues and the primary goal of this section? You know, it's it's interesting to me that the first time I read through this chapter, I was perhaps blissfully unaware of some of these arguments that are that are going on. You and I were talking a little bit uh, beforehand and uh, in sort of preparation for this. And I mentioned that I had done, uh, even just recently, just in the last uh, week or so, I've done a little bit of digging into my own particular denominational tradition. And I haven't found that this issue has, um, it, it hasn't had the impact that it perhaps has in some other um very closely related uh, denominations. Um, now, some of that you you describe, I think, that there there is a difference between those who are are scholastic and those who are very much non-scholastic or anti-scholastic. I think there is a sense in which uh, my own denomination probably tends toward the non-scholastic side on on a number of issues, but also has really. Um, spent much of the last 40 years dealing with, uh, I, I hate to say more practical issues, because that there is something practical about this discussion as well, but um, more sort of, uh, you know, on the ground within the congregation types of concerns, right? The, there was a, a split in our denomination over um, women serving uh, as pastors and elders, uh, and those who were opposed to that, many of them have left. And and there's uh, there's been uh, right now there's uh, likely to be a split uh, where a number of people who uh, wish to be more um, accommodating of of homosexual marriage seem likely to split to leave our our denomination. And uh, and those kinds of discussions have been well, they're difficult discussions, and they can lead to a, a lot of uh, um, you know difficult conversations, but also um, you know can have a, a major impact on the way things are done. But but that's where the focus has been. And uh, this issue, not so much. Uh, though I was aware that at least there were some, uh, you know, sort of outside my denomination and some uh, closely related denominations, there were at least some discussions about um, you know the the importance or the utility of somewhat more uh, scholastic uh, theologians. Those who, uh, for example, are are very much appreciative of of Turretin and see him as being very much the um, you know the sort of the natural uh, follower to uh, to the theology of Calvin. Uh, and 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 those who maybe were not quite as uh, enamored of of Turretin or or felt at least that that he maybe made some things narrow where they didn't need to be quite so narrow. So that's all a long way to say the first time I read through this, I was completely unaware of there being any issues. And in some ways it was kind of fun because I just read through this as, okay, oh, this is an interesting, okay, divine simplicity. What does it mean? And, and what does it mean that God is simple, that he's free from composition, that 
Uh, you can't make distinction between his being and his attributes. And and what does that mean for you know practically? What does that say about who God is? And and how you know if you if you go too far in one direction, you can start getting into concerns with even sort of a form of polytheism or or at, at the very least you know certain types of uh, uh, errors. And and but yet if you go too far the other way, <clears throat> are you becoming too narrow and too prescribed in how we understand uh, who God is and 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 how he uh, and how he acts and and how uh, his attributes are related to his his essence and um it, you know it, it it's it's an interesting discussion so then more recently in the you know in the last uh month or so as we're approaching this section and we knew that you know that this was potentially a uh, one of those areas where there might be those who would have uh, uh, very strong opinions and uh, might, you know, find that our take on some of these things or even Bobbing's takes on some of these things are are problematic. Um, you know, reading through it again and just sort of trying to identify, okay, how do we stay within those buoys and how do we uh, identify those those um, you know those those things under the water that that you know could could hang us up. Um, it, it was a very different way of reading through it. And I'll have to say, I kind of preferred reading it the first time when I was unaware of, of some of these uh, major uh, issues. And and I will say, I still, um, I, I, you know, I'll readily admit, I'm not, uh, these issues are still are not sort of fully crystallized in my mind. I, I tend to, as I think through a lot of these issues, I'm often focused not so much on, okay, so-and-so believes X, so-and-so believes Y, and here's the difference, but more on, okay, but where does that go? Where, what is the practical impact on how, uh, how do we live out our theology every day? And, that, and that's where, to some extent, um, and, and maybe the reason some people would think I'm a little too open on, on some of these issues, but uh, but to, to some extent, I'm like, does how much? I mean, yeah, way over on the far ends, there are problems. But how much does this really impact how we uh, how do we worship God in in our worship services, and how do we uh, how do we in society serve as 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 God's kingdom servants? It is not entirely clear to me how this debate is um, always. Uh, super helpful in in dealing with those things. So it, it'll be interesting. I, you know, I'm 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 looking forward, and and I'm hoping Brock that you have at least some um, a little more having maybe participated or maybe not participated, but maybe even been a little bit of a target in some of in some of these uh, uh, discussions. I'm I'm hoping that maybe you can sort of help uh, lead me and and other uh, and some of the viewers here. Uh, through what, what, what practically, what is the real argument here? Why is it that in certain corners of the reform world, this has become um, such a such a difficult argument, and one that has led, as you've pointed out, some people to throw out that um, that term of heresy. So, Chuck, let's get into the text from Professor Bovink, and. <clears throat> And I think what we're going to find is we're going to find virtues and we're going to find perhaps uh, different schools in different eras of time that are that have re different regards, uh, different battles that they're fighting. The war for the mind share in the culture <clears throat> is in a different place in these times. Now, getting into the text here, we're just going to start in. Uh, God is simple, that is, free from composition. One cannot make any real distinction between his being and his attributes. Each attribute is identical with God's being. He is what he possesses. And then later on it says this, God has no properties, but is pure essence. 
Now, Bavink notes that this divine of God's simplicity was the means by which Christian theology was kept from the danger of splitting God's attributes from his essence and making them more or less independent from and opposed to his essence. Now, this sounds dry until we take an example. And the first example that is <coughs> very modern is, is this. How many times have you heard an atheist say, I can't believe God would send even one person to hell. That isn't very loving, is it? You hear the pause, Chuck. You hear the power of this accusation. How can God be loving if he sends even one person to their final perdition, to this final doom. And in a lot of places, Chuck, that has a lot of sway. A lot of people are affected by this. But here's the issue. <clears throat> the argument rests on the power of love to check or thwart another power that God has, namely the power to adjudicate. You know, we can say the same thing uh, in our court systems, Chuck. You can, go, you can have a lawyer and you can go to the judge. You say, well, judge so-and-so, ju judge so-and-so is a really fair judge. Oh, no, if they're fair, well, how could they possibly sentence my little boy, Timmy? Well, the answer is, it is precisely because they are fair in a judicial sense. If little Timmy is found guilty of the crime, little Timmy's going to do the time. And that is not a violation of the judge's quote-unquote fairness or impartiality. And it's the same thing, too, with God. The atheist question, I, I, I'll, I'll often answer it this way. Oh, how could a loving God send even one person to hell? And my answer is God's love is never predicated at the expense of his justice. And that's exactly what the scholastics are talking about here. They are going to people like these atheists and saying, you can't make this argument because God does not sit under the court of a higher law of love. Rather, God himself is love. <clears throat> now, what is meant by that? The scholarly philosophic language can be confusing. God's, uh, hang on, let me go back here and, and read it just right, because if we don't read it just right, we're going to get yelled at. God has no properties, but is pure essence. <clears throat> well, that's great. What does that mean? Well, it precisely means this. It doesn't make sense to bring the categories against each other or against God. God's goodness is not at odds with his love. God's love is not at odds with his justice. His justice is not at odds with his wrath. Rather, all form the character of God in total. And so when we look upon those things, we're looking upon one God who inhabits all of these attributes in some way. And so when somebody starts to pit one against the other, you see this error of category. Now, somebody might say, is that special pleading on the part of religion? Why does God get a pass here? And the answer is <coughs> category errors are category errors whenever they come up, not just in religion. I'll give you an example of this. So-and-so 
is a married bachelor. Why then does a married bachelor have this property? Well, when you start with the concept of a married bachelor right away, you're presented with an incongruity. You're presented with a logical incompatibility. You're presented with a squared circle, Chuck. No offense to our boxing fans out there. But you're presented with something that cannot be, and thus the rest of the question is a nonsensical question. Well, if God is all-powerful, can he make a rock that he cannot lift? It's a categorical error to go down that route. It's a categorical error, for example, to reject the law of contradiction. Can God be both A and not A at the same time? Well, if so, then he is a contradiction. And if not, well, then we found, we found a flaw, a limitation, a lack of perfection in his character, some might argue. And so these scholastic arguments are really meant to come against things that would pit one part of God against another. Now, Professor Bovink gives us an example here. Uh, in Gnosticism, it made the Platonic ideas into these eons that emanated from God and distanced themselves in an ascending series. Now, Philo builds on this, represents the divine energies as hypostases. And then we, we have in Jewish theology and in the Kabbalah, <coughs> these emanations from the divine being. And then what we're going to see is, what does all of this mean? Well, it's going to turn into, it's going to turn into, well, this power is pitted against this power. By the way, this is what wrecked the Greek pantheon. Chuck, who was Zeus? Zeus was the supreme god of gods. And yet he was one god among many god. And, and Zeus was always underneath the categories of love and honor and justice. You could measure the Greek gods, Chuck. And in fact, many of the Greek, um, many of the Greek writings were about pointing out the limitations, <coughs> the foibles, of uh, the ultimate absurdities of the Greek gods. And sometimes it was pointed out for like a tragic and fatalistic purpose. And other times it was pointed out in an atheistic sense. And so the scholastics have always had noble motives here in trying to deal with these kinds of issues. And he talks about here, um, Professor Bobbink will say this, the moment monotheism is no longer supported by belief in the Trinity. It's threatened by pantheism or monism on one hand and by polytheism or pluralism on the other. What's that mean? Well, in modern times, not only do people practically put the state, science, art, industry, fortune, and fate as so many independent powers on a level with God and venerate them in the place of God, but sometimes even polytheistic sympathies are voiced with great candor as well. So, so Chuck, without yet getting to the core controversy, we've seen why the scholastics move in the circles that they're moving, some of the arguments that they're trying to fight. I think we can see a lot of the virtues in what they're trying to combat. Now, that's not the end of the story. We're, we're just at the beginning of the story, but, but when you hear that, Chuck, it, it brings the scholastics into a much more of a sympathetic light, doesn't it? What, what's your sort of take or response on that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so there are certainly to to use that buoy image that you you put up on the screen before. There certainly are dangerous waters 
And there are things in those dangerous waters that are likely to cause us all sorts of trouble if we try to row our boats into those into those waters. We could get hung up on debris in, in the waterway, or we could get caught up in currents that take us far away from, from the path that, that we need to go. And there is a sense, I think, that um, the, uh, the insistence, and there has been, but Bavin points this out, that there has long been an insistence on this idea that God is simple in, 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 in that uh, he is, uh, you know, you, you can't make distinctions between certain parts of, of who he is, between his being and his attributes. We, we can't sort of set, a, you know, set God's goodness against his justice, for example. Uh, and and that's, that's a smart thing. You know, we, we, we need to deal with those issues and we need to, uh, to argue against those who would try to do so, who would try uh, to, you know, make the argument that you've described that we do here nowadays, that, uh, you know, that God's goodness means that he can't possibly be entirely just, or that his mercy means that he can't be entirely just. And so that is absolutely a, a valid um a valid concern. And so out on out in those shoals of, of dangerous water, we need to stay away from there. And uh, this idea of divine simplicity helps us to do that. But now there are some the, the, the question becomes, um, does that channel have to be so narrow as you know that there there's there's no wiggle room whatsoever? Or is this idea of divine simplicity something that, yes, we're, we're going to accept, but we have to sort of see it also as an, an assist to get us to the right path rather than the destination uh, itself? And, and, and maybe that's, that's putting it too strongly, but I'm, I'm aware that, you know, as, as uh, um, orthodox and, and intelligent a scholar as... Um, uh, uh, I, I lost his name, Plantinga. Uh, uh, Alvin Plantinga has uh, had some questions about, well, what what does divine simplicity mean? And, and can you go uh, too far in the other direction, maybe towards, you know, the, the other buoy uh, and start getting into some other dangerous waters? Uh, if you don't recognize uh, sort of the limitation of uh, of the way that we talk about it, can can God, um, you know, be uh, you know an abstract object? Uh, is that all He is, uh, or is He actually a, a person? And and so those kinds of questions, I think that that Plantinga asks, in my mind, as I understand, and again, my my understanding is still quite limited on these issues. Uh, but my understanding here is that in asking those questions, Plantinga isn't necessarily trying to say, oh yeah, Bob Inc. and all those people who've come for the 2,000 years before just had it all wrong, and, and God is not a simple being, he's some complex being, and so let's go to pantheism or, or polytheism or something like that. But rather what he's doing is he's saying, let's, let's try to Let's try to get at what, what what is it really that we're after here, and and can we come to a sort of a better definition of of what it is that we're talking about? Can we sort of accept this general, uh, long-standing concept of God's simplicity, but understand it in a way that still gives some depth and um, maybe um, some complexity to the idea of simplicity, if, if that makes any kind of sense, that in some ways that's a little bit of a, um, you know, those words don't necessarily go together. It's a little bit of an oxymoron, but, but again, uh, there is a little bit of paradox, I think, because our, our minds as humans are, are limited. And, and so some level of paradox perhaps is, is appropriate here. So, so I know, and I know that, that Plantinga isn't the only one, uh, that has made challenges to divine simplicity. And some of the challenges that are out there uh, that I that I sort of ran into when I was trying to dig into uh, some of these issues, um, I, I you know I recognize that some of the challenges that are, are uh, that are out there are much more problematic uh, and and perhaps uh, go into those waters that the um, that that 
we agree uh, that um, uh, you know that, that we need to stay out of, and and that Bavink warns us against, and that the scholastics uh, warn us against. Um, uh, you know, and and so there are some of those arguments out there that I think we need to reject uh, for for that reason. Right, <clears throat> right, and, and and Chuck, we wanna we wanna emphasize that the scholastics have good reasons and noble motives behind so much of what they're doing. But we also want to note that it can be easy to overdo it. And, and toward that end, I want to just give an example for the audience of someone whom we Reformed theologians hold in high regard, but yet has moments of well, let's just read. Let's just read. I, I, I let's just read. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, no disrespect to our dear brothers who love the Reformed theologian Francis Turretin. Turretin is the scholastics scholastic, but it is exactly in Turretin that we see examples of some of the nonsense that passes for scholastic theology. And when I say nonsense, I'm not calling him a heretic. I'm not throwing him out of the club. I'm not saying he's not a brother. I'm not even saying he's not important to reform theology. I'm just saying, listen to this. Listen to this overstatement. I'm just gonna read a part. Now, I have to give a little bit of background. This is on divine concurrence which is a topic in Reformed theology. It's important. It matters. But yet at the same time, tell me if orthodoxy rises and falls on your agreement with this passage. Finally, one concourse is called previous and predetermining. Another, simultaneous or concomitant. The previous is the action of God by which he, flowing into causes and their principles, excites and previously moves creatures to action and directs to the doing of a particular thing. Simultaneous, however, is that by which God produces the action of the creature as to its being or substance by which he is supposed to flow together with the creatures into their actions and effects, but not into the creatures themselves. Although they do not differ really, but only in reason, because the simultaneous concourse is nothing else than continued previous concourse, which not only flows into the causes themselves, that it may work in them, but into the effect itself, so as to act with them, yet they can be considered distinctly. Chuck, help. Help. I don't have much help for you there. <laughs> help us, friends. Listen, scholastic brothers, we love you. Pull back from this precipice. A little bit more on this particular page. Now I'm going up to the top. This was part four in part one of the fifth question, does God concur with second causes, not only by a particular and simultaneous, but also by a previous concourse we affirm? Really? Now watch. Look. I'm going down here. Okay, here's the part we just read. I'm continuing. It's the same style of language and topic of reasoning. I'm continuing. I'm going through. I'm not halfway through this page yet. This is all the same thing. I'm, up, I'm just pausing right here. Since in every moral action, we must necessarily distinguish the substance of the act in the genus of being from the goodness and wickedness of the same in the genus of morals, the action of understanding and willing simply, which has a material relation. From the action of understanding and willing this or that lawful or unlawful object, which has a formal relation, 
it is evident that no action can be called essentially good or bad, but only as it is here and now circumstantiated in the genus of morals, i.e. with a relation to this or that good or bad moral object. Chuck, this is insanity. Now, we've come down to the end of the fifth question, and I want to highlight What is at the very edge of this five to ten page treatise? Chuck, look at me. Two. Two verses. Nineteen points. You see XIX. That's Latin for 19. There were 19 paragraphs in Turretin talking about how he answers the fifth question. And at the end of paragraph 19, he cites two verses. That that entire treatment is supposed to hang off of. Scholastic brothers, step away from the abyss. This is not helpful. Now, there's one other place where. Uh, one other example that I brought where we get into some difficulties from our scholastic brothers. And that is a requirement that orthodoxy begins with preambles of the faith, scholastic preambles. You cannot read the Bible faithfully. Some classic theists maintain. You cannot read the Bible faithfully until you are educated and in agreement with these preambula fidei, these preambles of the faith. And we're going to look at the 24 Thomistic theses. We're going to look at principle one. Here we go. Remember, you are not reading the scriptures well until you understand, agree, and affirm this classical principle. Potency and act so divide being that whatsoever exists either is a pure act or is necessarily composed of potency and act as to its primordial and intrinsic principles. Now we have some commentary here, which I'll read. Every actual subsisting being, inanimate bodies and angels, men, uh, inanimate bodies and animals, men and angels, creatures and creator, must be either pure act, a perfection which is neither the complement of potency, nor the potency which lacks further complement, or potency mixed with act, something capable of perfection, and some perfection fulfilling this capacity. This statement is true both in the existential and in the essential order. In each of these orders, the composition of act and potency is that of two real, really distinct principles, as being itself intrinsic to the existing being or to its essence into which, finally, all other principles can be resolved, while they cannot be resolved into any other. Chuck. Our classical brothers will throw you out of their reformed club if you don't affirm this. And I'm not speaking hyperbolically. There was a set, there was a group of Reformed Baptists, scholastics, that led, that led a series of wars in 2013 to 2015 to remove their non-scholastic brothers from their Reformed Association. They literally went to pastors 
in that association, pastors in good standing for almost 20 years, and said, do you affirm this? Is this the fundamental way that we talk about God? Because if you don't affirm this, you can't be in our Reformed Association. Chuck. Truth is stranger than fiction. And so the scholastics, in their noble attempts to do noble things, have, well, perhaps overplayed their hand. I'm really trying to think of a generous way to put this because I don't want to throw our scholastic brothers out of the club. I just don't want to be thrown out of the club by them for not affirming this statement and other statements. By the way, where does this come from? This is not from the Bible. The scholastics will tell you it's not from the Bible. This is Aristotelian philosophy. So, Chuck, without, without trying to, to beat the horse any deader than I, I suspect it already is, I just want to throw it over and say, help us, scholastic brothers. Stop, stop it with the insanity. Let's work together somehow, move this through, or continue prosecuting. And unfortunately, in the culture right now, Chuck, there is a push typically at a seminary level. Reformed seminaries now are facing pressures from the deans of their departments to sign off and affirm these principles or you're not on the faculty. And I don't know any other church age in recent history where that was a requirement. And I'm shocked that it would be now. So Chuck, we, we've talked about some awfully deep and scary situations, and I hope not ungenerously, but but this is pretty serious stuff. What, you know, you're on the outside looking in. How does it hit you, my friend, and what are the concerns that come into your mind? Yeah, uh, no, it, it, yeah, I am somewhat on the outside uh, looking in. I, and and to start with, just to, to reiterate a point you made earlier, I understand somewhat where uh, the um scholastic folks are coming from right to some extent what they are doing is in a in a milieu that is or per, you know may, maybe we're moving a little bit away from that but in a milieu where rational scientific discourse is how you prove things i think they are um create tr attempting to create a very rational well thought out um moves from point a to point b to point c to point d in a very rational way explanations for for some very difficult issues right so i think um one way to think about this i i i remember um struggling a little bit when i was uh getting ready to to, to preach a sermon and and trying to sort of get at the issue of how how can it be that god um you know desires uh what is what is best for his people and yet still sin exists in the world and bad things could happen and uh and you know a very rationalistic um a very scholastic uh, way of looking at that, and one that I still tend to think, uh, when when push comes to shove, I I tend to agree with, is this idea of of sort of different types of, you know, um, a, there's a decretive will, and there, uh, you know, the, the different kinds of ways of explaining God's will, His uniform will his singular will but that there's a couple of different ways of explaining it and, and and this was probably a dozen years ago and and i i think i made a little bit of a mess of it but i was trying to explain this idea but trying to do so in a way that would make sense to 
people in the pews and people who had dealt with these issues. And afterwards, a friend of mine is he's um he's about my dad's age. In fact, I think he is my dad's age. So you know, he's 22 years older than I am, wiser in in many ways. Uh, but also someone who who I've uh, you know we've been able to talk about things, and he's good at sort of accepting things that I know about in the same way that I'm good, I think, at accepting things that he knows about. And he said to me, Chuck, I don't think that sermon was helpful at all. <laughs> and he goes, you know, my my brother, who's also a member of the church, a couple years older, you know, he said his when his daughter died, he doesn't want to hear about decretive will of God. You know, that, that's not of any comfort to him. He, he, you know, um, when, you know, when his son-in-law and their kids struggle with the loss of their mother to cancer at a, at a fairly young age, she, she was um, around my age, but this, you know, this happened, uh, you know, a dozen years ago or more. So she was quite young. It's not helpful. Um, now, maybe there's some truth to this stuff, but does it does it really make you feel a whole lot better to say, well, this was God's decretive will, but it wasn't, you know, no, it it, it doesn't. Um, and and so I think that's maybe where folks who are on the more um, scholastic side of things, um, th where I think it would be helpful for them to think about, how do these issues come across? Sure, defend them. Um, and, you know, th there is a time and a place for those kinds of discussions. And in fact, there is some strength to those discussions in certain contexts uh, to be able to sort of rationally walk through um, step by step, point to point to point to point, how we think through these things and, and make them make sense in sort of a larger in sort of a larger uh, view of things, great. But if we push that too far, then when we get to the edges, what we find is we've lost some of not just our humanity, but we we lose some of who what who God really is. And yes, we can't push, we we can't separate God's loving kindness from you know his justice um but yet it isn't helpful to helping people who have gone through difficult times in their lives uh, and who need to understand god's loving kindness to have someone preaching in their face but loving kindness that's that's you know you can't separate that from justice justice is still a thing and, you know in at certain points in people's lives people need to hear primarily about certain things, about God's loving kindness. Other parts, times in their lives, they may need to hear about that justice of God. They may need to be confronted uh, with that justice of God. Um, but uh, but we do have to be careful to sort of uh, not, uh, you know, sort of end up in areas that that aren't helpful uh, to people in 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 their everyday lives. And and so I think that's in the end. I'll, I'll have to admit, Brock. Uh, on the one hand, when I read through some of the more scholastic ways of thinking about things, there, for me, there actually is somewhat of an attraction. Um, and there is a sense in which I'm almost willing to say, look, all right, guys, you're probably right about this stuff. Um, but you haven't yet explained it in a way where, yeah, the young family whose mother has just passed away, that, that it's going to be meaningful to them and helpful to them. You haven't explained it to in, in a way where someone who's just lost their job or someone who's going through, uh, you know, severe health issues or or someone who just can't deal with, you know, they're, they've, they've, they've got... Uh, um, addictions and things like that that they're they're fighting and they're they're doing their best to fight them uh but they're they're not quite there uh, you know these kinds of arguments don't help with those things and and there is a sense i think that um god being both you know being not just both but being loving kindness and justice all all wrapped up in one sim simply 
Um, I think he's going to be okay with the fact that we don't have sort of the, the logical progressions entirely correct as long as what we're doing is we're saying we we still are throwing ourselves fully into the into who God is, into his mercy, into his love, into understanding that that we are meant to be his servants and we're going to obey his word. And if we don't quite get, you know, the sort of those prefaces all quite right when we read scripture, I think the perspicuity of scripture as well, a wonderful reformed way of thinking about how we read scripture, uh, you know, sort of says, look, we can't force people to have understandings that for some people are is beyond their capability um, before we can say they can really understand scripture. Uh, and and so that's that's my concern um, with with where we've gone and where some people have gone with some of these things. Uh, uh, let's not forget the Kleine Leiden, uh, to, to use a term that that Abraham Kuyper used, and we've we've talked about in our discussions as well. There are many among the Kleine Leiden who are never going to understand a lot of these issues, and and does that make them lost? No, absolutely not. In fact, in many ways, I think sometimes I think God probably is like the Kleine Leiden. These are my people. They, they, you know, like you guys, you scholastics, you can deal with that stuff. You know, when you get to heaven, you can have a little corner over there and you can still fight about that stuff. But I'm here for the Kleine Leiden, for the little people who are here because they love me and they will keep my commandments and they desire uh, to be my servants, whether it's as a shoemaker or whether it's as a farmer or as a mother or whatever it is. Uh, but but that they're, they're still. Um, really seeking to be God's servants. So that's that's kind of where I end up uh, on, on these discussions. But again, I'm I'm always happy to discuss them. <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck, you know, you made some great points there. Now having having come out pretty heavily against our scholastic brothers for some particular excesses and not, by the way, out against them as brothers, and not throwing the entirety of scholasticism out. I think it's a fair question for a scholastic to ask us. Well, okay, you don't like our Turretin and our Thomistic Theses. You do better then. And I think they have a good point. It is up to us ministers of the gospel, to do better. Here's how I want us to do better. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Lord formed me from the beginning, before he created anything else. I was appointed in ages past, at the very first, before the earth began. I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth 
their waters. Before the mountains were formed, before the hills, I was born. Before he had made the earth and fields and the first handfuls of soil. I was there when he established the heavens, when he drew the horizon on the oceans. I was there when he set the clouds above, when he established springs deep in the earth. I was there when he set the limits of the seas so they would not spread beyond their boundaries. And when he marked off the earth's foundations, I was the architect at his side. I was his constant delight, rejoicing always in his presence. And how happy I was with the world he created. How I rejoiced with the human family. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Now, Chuck, we didn't necessarily answer all of the philosophic questions, but just by reading the scriptures, just by making them front and center, just by letting them say what they say, I think we have answered, we have presented content straight from the scriptures, unadulterated, not passed through an Aristotelian filter to filter out the bad parts or to, re or to deconstruct and then reconstruct later into a classical form. God's word will do all the heavy lifting required. And I think that's the better thing, Chuck. And I don't mean I don't mean to talk about this as if as if our scholastic brothers are against that. I don't mean that. But I just wish to say there's really no need for some of the directions scholasticism has taken. There's no need for uh, for the for the wars, for the um, for the purity wars, <clears throat> where if you don't affirm this set of Thomistic theses, or if you don't proclaim God as actus purus, you're just out. No room for that in a healthy, godly community of reformed believers. And I think we have an alternative, and I think it's the better thing. Chuck, let me throw it over to you for some for some final thoughts on this issue, and and maybe in your own mind, how does how does that kind of approach wrap it up, and and how would you compare that in your own mind with the with some of the things we talked about? Yeah, you know, in in many ways, what what you've said is that at the center of what it means to be Christian, what it means to believe, what it means 
uh, you know, to understand the scriptures is is Christ. Christ is at the center, and those texts that you uh, you know that you read from uh, show that in in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. We're we're talking about uh, Jesus Christ, the the center. Uh, there the the text that you had from from Proverbs. There's uh, it, it's sort of a, a discussion of wisdom, a personification of wisdom, but in doing so, it's really also uh, drawing us a picture of Christ, Christ being at the center of, uh, of our belief and our, of our religion. And th this last text as well uh, is really Christ is at the center of all of it. Christ, the head of the church, he's first in everything. Uh, God in his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross, his death and his uh, resurrection. And so Christ is at the center. Uh, and so, yeah, we can have uh, we can have good discussions. And I think there's there's a reason in certain contexts to have those discussions about things like uh, the simplicity uh, of God. So I think something that in, in sort of a general context, we, we you know, most reform uh, folks would, would uh, believe in, even if we don't say, mean quite exactly the same thing by that, even if there is a little bit of a, a width to that channel uh, between the buoys uh, that, that, that we're within, uh, but yet we can sort of uh, agree with that. But the reason we do that is not because the importance is what, what's most important is sort of our definition of simplicity. What's really important is that those buoys help bring us to Christ, the center, to Christ, who is the person through whom we are saved, through whom by our being connected with him, by his becoming our our adopted brother, that we now are a part of the family of God, and and that's what's truly important here, and that's what that's what we celebrated uh, yesterday uh, as we record this. Today is Easter Monday, and yesterday, uh, you and I, Brock, and our churches celebrated Easter, uh, celebrated the 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 key work that Christ has done for us, and now. Uh, is is continuing that work in many ways at the right hand of God before he comes again. Uh, that's the center of, of what we believe, not uh, you know not particular views on on divine simplicity. Now, uh, you know you you and I we talked about this you know with, with, because we're also interested in in the conversation. Um, and and it's perfectly fine to have those uh, those conversations. And there may be some folks out there listening who really just really dig the conversation and want to have that. And I think that's okay because God gave us minds. God gave us the ability to think through these things. Um, and 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 so for those who are inclined and whose walk with God, whose um, ability to uh, you know stay within those buoys and focus on the center of of you know what it what the the core core message of the gospel is this that center being Christ if if this is helpful to that great but let's also not uh, pretend that for every single person that that's going to be the most helpful thing to draw them uh, to Christ and and that's really what's what's truly important so uh, I'm going to close here in in prayer, um, and uh, and we'll we'll finish up with that. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for Jesus Christ, whose work is at the center of who we are. That's why we're called Christians, because we are followers of Christ, a Christ who who was with you from the very beginning, who was there when you created the world, when you set it on its foundations, who uh, has has been uh, God and with God from, from all times, before time and before space. And yet, at the center of our lives is this Christ who came and lived on this earth, suffered, died a, a horrible death uh, on the cross, a death that he did not deserve because he lived 
a perfect life on our behalf, but because of that perfect life and because of taking on uh, our punishment through death on the cross, and now because of his resurrection that we celebrated yesterday at Easter, we can look to Christ at the center of who we are as our brother, as the person who connects us with you. And we praise you and we thank you for that. As we have these discussions, help our discussions to be edifying, to be ways of helping uh, people to understand better uh, this gospel message, to become more connected with Christ at the center of our very uh, existence. Don't let these sort of arguments and these discussions uh, distract us from what is at the center of our very being, uh, Christ the Lord, who is risen indeed. This we pray in the name of your uh, blessed Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.